This is Khufu. You have called me to return. Oh, thank you, Khufu. Thank you for coming. Your previous session was ex exceptional. Thank you. Well, you asked interesting questions, and I gave interesting answers. Thank you. So Jim mentioned that you had the more information on the brain function. I'm very interested in that. But you have to ask some questions so I know which brain functions you wish to speak about. There's only millions. Uh huh. Um, right now I'm working on uh, cell to cell information transfer. So uh, the current hypothesis, current um, um, understanding of the mainstream science is that there is a signal coming through synapses, basically synapses. Synapses are uh, the context between their um, brain cells, between the neurons. And I'm realizing that there might be much more happening through microtubules and some other uh, waveguides. So the wa wave information could, could go from inside one branch, which is called axon, to another branch, which is also called axon. So between two axons can be some other context other than through the um, chemical, but it could be like wave transfer. There is all kinds of transfers. Let me start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Because what you're saying is true. There is other kinds of activities. But first it starts with some kind of need from the body. There is either pain stimulation, movement, something happening that the brain has to engage in. That is the first thing. The information goes to the appropriate portion of the brain such if it is if, if it's movement, it would go to the parietal lobe first, most likely. And then it bounces off the amygdala for, to find if that response is correct. There's always a secondary system because the brain is backed up to be perfect. Because if it wasn't, there would be a lot of irregular responses to regular action, actions. Does that make sense? Yes. Then, of course, the kind of response that's necessary will go through to the neurons and the axioms, etc. But the neurons, uh, before it even gets to the neurons in that part of the brain, it knows exactly what is going to happen uh, because the energy is distributed exactly perfectly to where it needs to go. The neurons will be also contacted, but other things are being contacted simultaneously. It has to be that way for the proper appropriate action to come um, correctly. And it has, it's being sent also to the amygdala immediately as well. So even though the amygdala is the secondary response, it must have an immediate, re it must go there immediately also. But the primary response is in the, the, the part of the brain that deals with the particular kind of thing that's being expressed. If it's emotion, it would go to the frontal lobe. Uh, movement would go to the parietal lobe first. Uh, behavior also in the frontal lobes, etc. Uh, you understand these areas, I'm sure. I'm more interested in uh, what happens between the two cells and within the cell. Within the cell, oh yes, within the cell, energy is released, of course. Now, the kind of energy is, that re is released has to deal with behavior, emotion, movement, the different things that are being interacted with. Not all energies interact with emotion. Not all energies interact with movement. Not all energies interact with pain. You understand that, correct? Right. So therefore, the appropriate energy will be distributed to the appropriate places. Within the cell, that is, there are several sections of the neuron, actually, that can accept all these energies. And it will, when it's accepting the energies, will actually respond accordingly. Now, you have all these other branches where it's going out and sending the response, the actual response 
is being sent out as well at the same time, correct? Um, I guess, yeah, uh-huh. I'm, 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 I'm talking about the DNA in the nucleus and microtubules that go from the nucleus to the other neurons. And there is some sort of information of uh, vibrational uh, energy transfer between uh, the two cells. So how does it go it from the microtubules? It can do it in many different ways. It can actually do it through uh, waves. It can do it through, well, you understand that energy comes in different forms. Mm -hmm. just as light is wave and particle. You understand that, correct? Mm -hmm. Wave and particle can be part of the same substance. And so that is the same with some of these energies. They can act as waves and particles. So they can react as a particle for one uh, particular emotion or uh, reaction and a part of, uh, wave is another part of the reaction. So yes, there is communication in many different ways. There is a circuitry. There is connections to all things. You realize that the brain is redundant and it does, uh, it, the information is moved around to other parts of the brain as well for clarification uh, if necessary. So yes, it has to uh, use different kinds of energies and different kinds of circuitry to get all the information across uh, as quickly as it does. And you're right, it uses particles, it uses circuitry, it uses waves. Now, you, you understand the experiment where one uh, molecule, when it is attached to another one, no matter how far away it is, they will react exactly the same? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this it's... Uh... Uh, quantum, we call it quantum entanglement. Yes, and that is also part of the brain. Quantum entanglement, if you call it that. Whereas one, one motion is attached to other parts of the brain. And that, and that is a quantum entanglement. And there's millions of these in the brain. All right. Um, Pukharik... Uh, was uh, given the information that for the soul to to do astral travel, um, he was given a mushroom, the, the knowledge of the mushroom, um, how do you call it, muscaria, I'm, I'm blanking on the name, muscaria, the red, uh, red hat with the, with the white spots. Mescaline. We, we, we have lots of them in Russia, yeah. And uh, the question is, how does it work on the molecular level? What, what, what does it do with the soul on the molecular level? It sends information to it, of course. What happens is this. When you take something that is physical, such as a mushroom or something, it must go through the digestive system. It doesn't go directly to the soul, but it goes to the digestive system, information that goes to the brain that opens areas of the brain that will speak directly to the soul. Now, it doesn't, you realize the soul is the essence of the humanity, but it also depends on the brain to be activated in some ways because information activates the soul. Does that make sense to you? Uh, more or less, yes. Uh -huh. Or actions may activate the soul, but it's, it's a spiritual entanglement with these, this particular part of the brain. The part of the brain that activates the soul is a spiritual activity, such as when you feel, uh, when you are able to speak to angels, when you are able to contact uh, entities that are in seventh dimensional areas, the soul has to be activated. And so this is part of the, what the mushroom does. It activates that part of the brain that is connected to spiritual uh, awakening and soul activity. Believe it or not, there is a place in the brain that does that. So then, um, how does it relate to astral travel? Apparently the soul leaves the body, so the mushroom somehow helps the soul to disconnect while the consciousness, the mind is still active. So the participant is actively participating in the travel and comes well, back and still remembers it. The thing is, it's not the actual soul that goes. 
It's the spirit that goes. The soul has to sit, stay in the body for life to remain. But the spirit of the body, which is something that is a, around, that is connected to the soul but not is the soul, can leave the body and move with a consciousness to other places. Now, the soul must stay somewhat intact. Yes, part of the soul may go with it, if that's what you wish it for it to do. But without the soul, the body dies. So the soul or the spiritual part of the body and part of the soul, per perhaps, goes along to these other places. This is activated by a portion of the brain which is in the back, uh, in the back of the head, near the okay. god, near the crown, and near the god chakra, which is okay. opposite of the third eye. Okay. So uh, one of the ideas of my ideas of my understandings is that normally we are blocked from the memory. So when we travel to the to the other dimension, we come back. We can't remember stuff. Maybe the Amanita muscaria. Muscarium, uh, maybe it blocks that forgetfulness, and that's how we're able to travel and then come back and remember. What happens is this. You will not remember a full trip in the astral because there's some of it that doesn't matter. But it all will come back to the subconscious. The part that comes back to the consciousness is the part that is important. The memorable portions of it will be remembered. You may have had a very long trip, seemingly hours, but only can remember 10 minutes of it because that is the part that is important, the part that must be remembered. If it is something that must be remembered, it will come back to the consciousness. If it is not, it will come back to the subconscious and the Akashic record of the body. So what is the chemical mechanism? Is it happening on the cellular level? Or what does the uh, mushroom substance do? The mushroom substance activates a part of the, the brain that is connected with spiritual activity. The third eye, the god chakra, the crown. These are the areas that are activated with the god chakra. You, uh, I mean, with the, uh, this particular mushroom. You realize that these portions that are activated are actually not part of the brain. Just like the chakra system, they're outside of the system. However, they can be activated in the third dimension some ways. And the brain sends signals to these off-body areas to be activated so that you may experience things from other dimensions. I, um, I recently just uh, found a lot of inform uh, some information that uh, mushroom networks uh, underground, the, the, the mushroom underground roots uh, in the forest, they make a huge network which is conscious. And I assume when uh, people um, eat the mushroom, they connect to this network and are being guided by that network. Is it, is it about yes. right? Well, let me tell you that the connection underground is the neural net for them. They do not think with their mushroom heads, if you will, but through the uh, a community consciousness through their network underground. So, yes, you're taking that... Uh, when you take a mushroom out of the ground, you're taking some of that network with you. And that is a spiritual network. It is a conscious network. It is a network that doesn't work on the same, in the same way that the human body works. It is a, a highly advanced, higher neural network of information. And so therefore, it, it is, has that contact with spirituality. Are these uh, substances specially developed by this mycorrhizal network for humans, or are they made, uh, are they just by chance that they activate our connection? No, they are made to work with humans by design. Uh huh. 
because Pukharik was observed how the the mushroom bodies grow really fast and they have been guided. Uh, Pukharik was guided to this body. So it looked like there was some guidance from the mycorrhizal network to the to the mushrooms and there was a lot of guidance in his work. So somebody guided that from Absolutely. the Absolutely, I was there to guide him. The mushroom entities in their neural network had messages for him because he was aware that they could do this for him. He had an awareness of things that was far beyond what you could understand. Most humans could not understand what kind of awareness he had. So what's the, what's the agenda of the mycorrhizal network? What, what, what's their um, purpose of doing all of that? What is their purpose? Their purpose is to survive, of course, as a community and uh -huh. um, bring a nourishment to the earth to bring uh, different uh, positive things to the planet, positive uh -huh. energies, positive understandings, but when used outside of their natural cause uh, for the earth, for ecology and things of this nature, then they can be used for a spiritual use for humans and for even some other species. So when humans take um, uh, these uh, psychoactive mushrooms, they go into some places which look different than uh, in other spiritual experiences. It looks like they get in some other layer. Is it kind of lower vibration or is it, uh, it's, it looks like more like underground, some sort of areas. Yes, what is all right. Well, that's because the mushroom is familiar for, with those kinds of areas. They are familiar with the energies underground. They are familiar with the energies that are connected to spirit as well. So you go to all different kinds of places. Let me explain about where uh, you may be taken with a mushroom experience because there are many different places you can be taken. The thing is, every different species is in their own portion of their dimension. You are in third dimension, but you are in your portion of third dimension. Other third dimensional creatures are in their portion of third dimension because they were not created at the same moment that you were. And they have either, uh, uh, they are advanced in their time or uh, they are uh, behind your time. And so their portion of third dimension is not exactly the same as yours, even in the energy. Whenever you go to another planet or another place that is less dense or whatever, even a mountaintop, you will notice a less density, a different third dimension there. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. So different portions of third dimension may have different kinds of life and species uh, that you may not understand because the energies are slightly different. They grew up in a different condition. They have a different kind of sun. They have a different kind of ecosystem, et cetera, et cetera. So even though it's third dimension, it may not be like your third dimension. You're going to other third dimensions and perhaps even higher or lower because these are the dimensions that the mushroom is connected to spiritually. Right. Um, it, is a, it is an interesting concept. I know that you're saying, what do you mean different third dimension? But even in your own world, there's different third dimensions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how do you communicate with the mycorrhizal network? Because you are, uh, Pukharik was getting information from you and from them at the same, at the same time. So you were, somehow linked together. What, what was your interaction? We are linked together because in some of my past lifetimes, I was in the tree kingdom. I was a tree being and I can, and I have been a Chikani. I was linked to my past nows and my present nows and my future nows. And I understand how to link with the past in a way that it can be meaningful. And with this particular individual, I was able to get understanding that he could 
understand where I was going with these connections. And he was surprised to find how much information was there in the, in the even lower realms that humanity does, still does not grasp. Mm. Yeah, talking about another, uh, other dimensions, I was exposed, I was reading a book, another book by, ab about, um, there was a huge portion there about spoon bending. Yes. And um, Uri Geller Uri. was, Uri Geller was, is capable of uh, uh, having lots of people um, holding their spoons and when he invites them to bend them, all the spoons or many of the spoons are bending. So, it's not only him doing that. It's like the whole uh, connect, just connecting to him allows people to bend spoons with their mind. Exactly. And, but and I'm it's trying. Their belief, he is attached to their belief systems. He is attached to their positive belief systems. And if they want the spoon to bend, it will bend with his energy and their energy combined. Their energy must be involved in it in some way. If they do not believe in it, it will be much harder for him to bend it with only his own energy, although he could do it. But with other people's energy being involved, it is much easier to bend the spoon because he is taking the energy from their belief system and using it with his own. So I was very excited. I tried to bend spoons and connect to his energy and I had zero success. I mean, the spoons didn't bend. You have, to, you have to develop that portion of your mind. And uh -huh. you can do that. Anyone can do it on earth. It is not telekinesis, but it is something else. It is a muscle of the brain that must be exercised. I just wonder if taking a mushroom and trying to bend a spoon would help. It is possible. It may, uh, it may allow you to experience that portion of the brain that is the muscle that is behind all these things. Do it with intention, and intention does help. But you remember this, you don't even have to do it with intention if you know, if your body already knows what you intend to do. So if you have many intentions in the body, in the mind, in the spirit, you don't have to bring one forward you just take it and ask them to use the intentions that are positive within you. Ask the, who? Ask who? Ha, ask the energies of the mushroom. Oh, got it, got it. Uh -huh. um, coming back to their cell, uh, so there is like uh, neurons in the brain and there are glial cells, and apparently glial cells are as important as neurons, but they, they don't do any electric stuff. They kind of do non-electric communication. Chemical. So, I, uh, okay, when I say electric, I mean uh, action yes, potential, know. action potential. And yes. when yes. you say chemical, I understand just releasing some chemicals. It's a slow process. I'm talking about uh, very exciting new development of um, Stuart Hameroff that um, there is a third, third, there is a third way through microtubules, and it is uh, waves. Apparently, it is waves, and is uh, it is much smarter than than uh, chemical or um, action potential. So non-electrical, not chemical, but electromagnetic or or some other energy, maybe it's some, some more complex energy just, than just plain electromagnetic. Absolutely, yes. So I'm talking about this microtubule or energy transmissions. And I'm hoping, I'm suspecting that glia would be involved in microtubular energy transmissions. Yes, that's true. And I think that the, the um, key or the, the yeah, the key to dis the deciphering that would be the DNA. So there is a DNA course, in the nucleus, yeah. in, in the nucleus, and there is microtubules somehow talking to the nucleus on this energy level. And then they, they, uh, they and this energy looks, it looks like it's not just flying everywhere. It looks like it's guided by um, uh, waveguides, waveguides. So it's, uh, it's a tubular transmission. It's, 
uh, it's, it's a network where the, the signal goes through the tubes. So it's a, like, uh, how do you say it? Um, hold on a second. They're pipeline, pipelines, yes. Complicated set of pipelines. And um, the question is, uh, in the DNA, uh, my main uh, candidates for, for resonance are the sequences which are called alus and lines, line ones. Alus are uh, unique to primates, so it's something very unique to humans and, and other primates. No, no other animals have that. So my suspect, suspect that alus are the key sequences, DNA sequences that make us human. And we have million of them per cell. So it's a lot of them in, in a single cell and you know, every cell has them. So, so one, and alus, they, they're pretty structured. They're pretty similar to each other. So I wonder what kind of energy is alu energy? Can you, can you elaborate well, on that? Energies in the alu that you have not discovered yet. Because, of course. Uh, but the colors will help you to find them. The thing is about the alus is this. They are designed to have many kinds of reactions. They are designed to send out uh, wave reactions, electronic reactions, uh, pipeline reactions, if you will. They are meant to do that quickly so that things can actually be produced and uh, done, especially in thought process. The alus are there because thought process is much more complex in humans. That is the big difference between humanity and the animals, is how you think. And so the alus are all about how you think, how thought process is generated, how it is kept and structured. Now, you may have many parts of the brain that are open, some parts still closed, of course. You only use about 10 or 11% of the brain. So these alus are formatted to use that portion of the brain as best as possible when, whenever they are in perfect condition. Now, you know that there are those that come into the world that are not perfect and their alus are damaged. And so their thought process may not come in with them, but they can be fixed, but only if you knew how to do it. But it would be an electromagnetic and a chemical uh, combination that would fix them. However, the alus are there for thought process in many, many respects. Um, so when uh, Earth humans are taken to the fourth dimension, they can function there just fine. Uh, we know that some humans emigrated to the fourth dimension and, and settled there without much, um, and their geno genomics, their genetics wasn't changed. So apparently we well, can function. It a little. It has to change a little in the fourth dimension. Now let me tell you what has happened. Yes, mm -hmm. they have integrated into the fourth dimension, but not not without uh, some help. There is some help available in the fourth dimension to bring third dimension into fourth dimension in a, in a very healthy way. And they have discovered this, and there is not much change to the DNA. The DNA becomes fourth dimensional eventually. But remember, it is not fourth dimensional to start with. So they must allow it to become fourth dimensional and they add the third strand of DNA to do that. The d third strand of DNA is available to humans, but it's in another dimension. It is not in the third dimension. And when humans go to the fourth dimension, they can, with help, start to use that third dimension, uh, that fourth dimensional third strand, which does not interloop with the first and second strand. It is totally separate. So it, it does not have to interwind with that spiral ladder at all. It is outside of that. Okay. So it is so that it is that that is ignited and they do a little bit of work on that and then humans from third dimension can actually survive in the fourth. 
Is the third strand shorter? Is the what? Is the third strand shorter? No, it is not shorter. It goes the length of the ladder, if you will, but it is not interwoven into it. It's outside because of it, sort of like I, an arc over top of it. When our um, cells divide, uh, then uh, the two strands are used as a template, so the each, each of them are they separated, and each of them serves serves as a template, and there is another strand uh, built on uh, upon each of them. So yes. when you have a third strand, it has a it has it should have a couple to it. I mean, the, the DNA always comes in pairs. How can third strand be single? It should be third and fourth together. It does not necessarily need a coupling because it is not there to add anything to the system, but to guide the system and give it energy from a different way, in a different way. So it does not need a coupling because you have that coupling with your, your human DNA. The third strand is there to add information and energy to those two and not be a part of a it's a third strand but it's not a third strand in the sense that it's not there to be a to create newer things in the body or newer dimensions in the body except to integrate everything together into a fourth dimensional understanding now, so, higher uh, dimensions uh, will have couplings with them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in, our, in our dimension, the two strands of DNA create um, a perfect liquid crystal within them, which is called um, the core, or it's called the base stack, base stack. Yes. So, because understand. the bases are stuck there. So, uh, so the third strand somehow transdimensionally couples into that base stack as well? Absolutely, yes. So it's not it, separate, it's kind of just uh, another dimension adds another mirror to these two strands, right? Exactly. It, it will mirror the two strands and add what is necessary for it to come into the fourth dimension, but it also, there are in the fourth dimension, there are different things that you must deal with. As, mm -hmm. uh, as, as a creature of the fourth dimension, there are things you have to deal with that are not uh, common to four, uh, third dimension, such as less density. You can walk through walls and uh, in certain places, not everywhere, but in certain places you may be able to go through there because the DNA is aligned with those portholes you cannot see through them, but you can go through them. Does that make sense to you? Uh huh. So, so yes. uh, there are densities. There is still a density in fourth dimension that you cannot walk through, but there are designed areas for fourth dimension that can be moved through, and it seems like you're walking through a wall or a door or whatever. Uh huh. So the. Um their normal DNA, physical DNA, uh, has a lot of proteins bound to it, like transcription factors, chromatin factors, uh, uh, nucleosomes, and other proteins. So lots of protein activity. And uh, would the third strand be also dealing with the proteins? Absolutely. There, you cannot <laughs> not deal with the proteins and all the different things that are in the, the, the original... DNA. The third strand, like you said, is a mirror. It shows, it, it may appear to the human DNA as two strands, but it's only one because it is a mirror of its activity put into one strand. And wow. there is more to it than that. So, w would it have its own sequence? How would its sequence yes, would be? It has, it has to have its own sequence in order to bring everything into the fourth dimension properly. It has to uh, change the DNA from third dimensional to fourth dimensional, and it has to do that 
in a very kind way because if you change the dimension of a third dimensional DNA quickly, you will have a bad reaction with the body. But as you add the third strand, you must do a gradual change. Uh, it's like a, a transfusion of blood, if you will. You must slowly transfuse the blood so that all the bad stuff is out. It's the same way with the third strand. It will transfuse DNA out of the body and put the new th fourth dimensional DNA in, in a very loving and caring process, not to shock the body in any way, but it must be done so that they can survive in third dimension more than 30 days. So does Yuri Geller uh, carry this fourth dimensional strand here in the third dimension? He has the beginnings of it, yes, but not the full strand. The full strand is not in third dimension, no. So what, what biologically, what does make him uh, able to do high dimensional stuff here? What, what's the reason? Um, he is an area of the brain that is open to this. It's like, it's in the area of telekinesis, but it is not telekinesis. It is something uh, similar, but not the same. It is the ability to reach out and uh, uh, bend energy, if you will, an energy bending portion, just just as you try to bend energy and do so in many respects, but this is a much more physical bending of energy because it is not the spoon energy. It is made of energy. It, it is, you must picture the spoon as energy itself and have it move for you in that way. Now, um, in our two strands, if one strand has a, uh, a, uh, a nucleotide, then the second strand would have T, they, they come in pairs, and A yeah. has two, two, two aromatic rings, yes. uh, hexagon and pentagon uh, fused together, and T has only one aromatic ring, which is a hexagon. Now, the third strand, how can it mirror uh, a and T, a pair of A and T, I mean, it's really hard to merge them together because one has two rings, another has, has one ring. How can you mirror it into one DNA strand? It is not, it is not in the shape of a hexagon or a, uh, a the other pentagon. It is a, a 12 dimensional, it's a 12 sided figure. Gosh, so it doesn't look like DNA at all. No. Weird. Okay. All right. Yes, it's beyond what you can actually see and it, it does not even matter at this time to you because that will that is very future generations that will have to deal with that. But at this time, you are dealing with the actual DNA, and uh, there are many energies and many thought processes about that that are still unknown to you. And I have given you some clues to how to get to them, uh -huh. and, and I have given you some ideas about the amygdala that you did not have, and, uh -huh. um, and I've given you some ideas about how it works simultaneously with many things and uh, I know that you had some ideas about this. I, I believe you must have had some because they wouldn't be allowing me to let you have that information unless you had a concept of it. Thank you. So um, aloe is 300 bases long and it's unique to humans. And the second uh, very frequent uh, uh, repeated, repeated element, repetitive element is called line one. And it's not unique to humans, it's uh, common to, to mammals. The mice have also line ones. And it is much longer, it's 6,000 bases long. So if you look at the vibrations of uh, something shorter and something bigger, the vibrations of something bigger would be usually slower just because of the electro, 
electrical proper, electromagnetic properties of the antenna. So I wonder how the energies of ALU would be different from energies of line one. ALU is, the energies of ALU are, are, like I said, they are meant for thought processes, generation of thought, intellectual storage, all these different things that um, mammals and animals do not have, whereas the line ones are about it, more instinctive things, more basic things. And the, the, the thing is about the length of it is, is it goes along with the size of the, the animal in some cases. So if you look at an elephant, their line one would be also larger. So um, the thing is about the, the line one is it, it does not necessarily vibrate slower but it has different sections to it that vibrate when they need to vibrate. And that, those vibrate at, at a high resonations. And uh -huh. so even though you may have a longer line one, only part of it is a, a vibrating at once. So we are looking for a, a signature in a genome which would define the shape of the animal. Uh, what would the, what the shape of the animal written in line ones? The shape of the animal would be written in some places in line ones, but it's also written in the basic DNA. The basic DNA of anything has many repetitive portions to it that have uh, features of what that creature is and or person or whatever. And so therefore, the basis of DNA, you will start off with uh, the egg and the sperm, which creates a, the DNA that makes the humans, that it both, both of those have certain DNAs that come together, just like earth and sky come together and make a different energy. Uh, the egg and the sperm come to, together to make a different energy, to make a, a combination of DNAs. So... From that moment, the DNA has specific uh, features written all over it. Now, it can be changed by alcohol use, drug use, accidents, things of this outside uh, energies, but it basically comes together with a pure format originally. Uh -huh. so, so and that is from that, every creature is made, and from that, all information is there. All the information is within the DNA, the basic DNA. And I know there's alus and uh, lines in there, but you will see that altogether, it will make a different kind of DNA than an animal DNA. If you're looking at animal DNA, you will see the definite distinction. Uh, there is an idea by um, popularized and proposed by um Rupert Sheldrake, that actually the shape of the body is not recorded in the DNA, and the DNA is only the key, the bar tag, barcode, which uh, re retrieves the shape of the body from the Akashic record or from uh, morphic field. Well, scientifically, all the information is there, because otherwise it could not attach to the right portion of the Akashic record. Uh huh. So, in addition to lines and one uh, line ones and and alus, there is a third very popular repeat, which is uh, telomeric repeat. It's very simplistic. In humans, it's G G G T T A, six letters repeated many many times. G G G T T A, and in uh, plants, it's shorter. It's like G G T T A, and in um, Insects, it's longer, so it's like six in humans, five in plants, and seven in insects, so other way around, I forgot. Uh, yeah, it would be nice to remember that, but um, what, what, what's its purpose? I mean, what, what is resonation? What's the energy? It's a basic survival, a basic survival energy instinct, and this uh, gives the instincts to the each different uh, thing, uh, plants do not need much instinct 
because mm -hmm. they are there to grow, but they do have instincts when it comes to soil, water, rain, different things. So they do have these uh, the at heat and light and things of that nature. So they react instinctively to these things. Humans need a greater amount of that so they have greater instincts. Now, with an insect, they have to have instincts about survival far beyond what humans do in some ways because they are still thought to be destroyed and they are still there, they are considered pests. And, and um, so their instinct about survival is higher and reaction times are higher. That is, their, re their reaction time is part of that. Recently a fly woke me up and uh, I just wonder, uh, was it uh, some spirits working through a fly? They can. They can work through anything, my friend. They can work through anything. If a spirit chooses to work with you through anything they, that they choose, even a pot or a chair or anything, they can use it. I just wonder, maybe flies are more connected to the spirits than um, other beings on Earth. It is possible. I do not see that at this time, but some flies may be very highly spiritual. I do not know. An Egyptian, um, an Egyptian uh, art, there is a lot of uh, this, the bug which uh, rolls a ball, how do you call it? A roll Dung ball in... The dung beetle? Possibly. Um, is, this, is this anything so spiritual about him? The dung beetle rolls things in a ball because this is his way of, well, he uses his saliva and whatever things that he uses. He has to secrete this. And so to get rid of this secretion, he makes a ball with it. And it, it helps him to uh, stay normal. So it is part of his life cycle to do this. Egyptologists, uh, Egyptologists say that he's a symbol of uh, rebirth because he makes a ball, ball of dirt and then this dirt uh, gives birth to, to life and there is a plant growing out of it. That is very possible. Many times when they roll these balls, they will get a seed or something uh, that will be growing in it and they've attached a sort of spirituality to that and the dung beetle is something special to them. So, yes, the scarab. Oh, scarab, yep, exactly. Um, now, um, the microtubules, one of the properties of microtubules, uh, which are inside the cytoplasm, they, they go radially from the nucleus to the, um, through the axons, and they're very critical for information transfer. So they are growing and decaying from the ends all the time. If they stop growing and decaying, like assembling, disassembling, they, uh, they're defective and the information transfer stops. And it's puzzling me, why would you need to do growth and um, this is assembly disassembly at the, at the ends for information transfer. We don't have any knowledge of that in our human electronics. We don't do that. Well, have, do, the thing is, they are constantly renewing themselves to be fresh. The energy must be fresh. The energy must be fast. And if they were using, uh, if they did not do that, it wouldn't be as fresh and quick. So they redo themselves, they recreate themselves so that everything is new and fresh and the energy, it can be used appropriately. Now there are um, ways to watch uh, live cells um, on the video and apparently lots of them do, uh, uh, you know, how blind people touch the environment, the, the cells kind of grow little appendages and uh, sense what's around them, especially like there is a sort of a mold which does it, slime mold, and it's, um, 
it senses the environment and it goes and expands and, and um, contracts all the time. And that's about the same behavior. It's like sensing the environment. And yeah. uh, the same bra brain cells do that all the time. They kind of expand, they grow and retract, grow and retract and make new connections and break, new con break the connections. Exactly, yes. Yes, um, I understand that, yes. So is there any like spiritual meaning for that? Well, when they grow and they expand, they're reaching out for a different, usually when this happens, people are learning People are uh, experiencing something. They're gathering information. They're seeing something. They're these th these things are happening. Uh, the the uh, they're expanding for a reason, and they're sending out these signals to uh, connect with whatever it is that they, it needs to connect to. Whatever this thought process needs to connect to. Sometimes though, it connects with the wrong thing such as fear or negativity. But many times it tries to reach out for a positive connection and it isn't there. And so therefore it, dec it, it uh, detracts. But the thing is, after it makes a connection and there is a wave or a, or a energetic uh, att attraction or connection, then it can contract again and when that thought comes again, it will have that, the correct channel that it goes to for that connection. When I um, do my science, I always, often, uh, almost always use my intuition. So I, I um, that's why I cannot work when I take uh, any medications because they break intuition. So of course. I, I um, tune into the task and usually it takes me a couple of minutes to get to their answer. So I, I wonder what's the mechanism. Maybe that's, um, I ask myself to start growing and creating a network through the physically reassembling or re... Remember this, whenever you are taking medication and you're trying to do thinking and uh, learning, it changes the way the brain is reacting. So therefore, that is why you can't think properly the properly because these the cells are expanding in a much slower way they're not reaching out to the right things perhaps it is uh you're it's telling the brain to stop and to uh, the body to relax so that you may get well it's about the physical body and not the brain some of these chemicals so it affects the brain in a negative way because it stops the brain from working so the body can relax and heal. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I recently used, uh, I used, uh, how do you call it, uh, a tablet with marijuana, it's legal here. So, um, and I did it a little early, so I had extra time and I was continuing to listen to an audio book. And at some point, like half an hour after taking a tablet, it was a small dose, but after taking a tablet, I was, uh, I noticed I cannot understand what they say because I understand the sentence, but I have no memory of the previous sentence. So the whole story doesn't make any sense anymore. Yes, I just wonder. Uh, it's reaching out for some, uh, something beyond the third dimension. It's not looking for third dimensional understanding. It's looking for beyond third dimensional understanding. So it's moving the words around to create a higher understanding, but yet you lose track of the third dimension with these kinds of experiments. So I wonder what was the biochemical mechanism? It does something in the brain, but what is it? It changes how it looks at the connections. Mm -hmm. That's very simple. It changes the... It, it, it's looking at the connections differently. So the usual this a thought process would cause the correct connections in the brain. The, the brain cell would expand, put out the feelers, know exactly where to go, and create that, create that uh, uh, line or uh, that energy flow. But with something like this, uh, 
it would uh, start to grow and not be able to connect to the proper connection. So it would want uh, a different connection. It would want an extraordinary connection rather than the ordinary. So our um, key to the DNA function is that base stack, which is uh, the core of DNA, and it has this uh, combined uh, chemical structures called indoles, where a hexagon, aromatic hexagon is connected to, arom uh, fused to aromatic pentagon, making this number eight shape, or yes. infinity, infinity shape. Yes. And when these are stacked on top of each other, helically, like with a little, like a ladder, they create a special, uh, uh, it's called delocalized electron cloud. So the electrons are delocalized along the uh, DNA double helix core, uh, making a huge cloud of uh, very interesting shape, supporting very interesting vibrations. And now uh, marijuana's cannabinoids, I believe they also have some sort of affinity. Uh, they also have this, um, aromatic structure which uh, somehow should interfere with this electron cloud, maybe in the DNA or in some other parts of the cells, maybe outside of the nucleus. Maybe there are also the microtubules, there are yes. some aromatic sending, clouds. They're sending, if you go backwards from what I was saying about the cell, it goes back to there, goes back to the where, the, where everything comes in, it goes to directly to the DNA and Yes, it does affect the origin, the way that the connections are made to the mind. So it changes the frequency. Absolutely. Does it make the frequency uh, more four-dimensional or more uh, spiritual depends, dimensional? How does it? It depends on the individual. There are many individuals that have no fourth-dimensional energy or thoughts about fourth dimension. And so it does not necessarily take them to the fourth dimension, but it clarifies the third dimension in some way, or it makes the third dimension different for them so that they can enjoy it. Many do this for recreation so they can enjoy the third dimension, not go into the fourth dimension and not move out of the third dimension, but actually use it as a sedative for the third dimension. Others right. can use it, to move into fourth dimensional thought processes, if that is their intention. You see, the, the, um, your mind knows the intention before you take it. Before you take a drug, your mind knows what you intend to do with it to some extent. And of it course. will do that for you. So when a person takes, um, takes a mushroom, uh, it connects, uh, the person connects to mushroom consciousness. And when a person takes marijuana, do they connect to marijuana consciousness? <laughs> yes, in some ways. Uh, they, they connect to a consciousness that the marijuana can connect to. They understand right. that there is certain kinds of consciousness for different kinds of drugs. And yes, I suppose you could say that marijuana does uh, connect to that consciousness that it is able to connect to, yes. So they kind of come together to all humans who took marijuana in the past and kind of to the morphic field of that vibration. Yes, and it depends on your vibration too, but remember, before you even take a drug, you have a certain perception of what you are expecting. And sometimes if you take a drug and you're a little bit fearful or anxious, sometimes that's what you get out of it, a heightened ex extent of that. So some, some few days after I took uh, such a drug, I still have trouble staying in my body. I kind of shift away from my body and have to force myself back into the body to, to function. Yes, the reason is for that is this. The subconscious remembers the, the state that you were in, enjoyed that state, and wants to reproduce it. All right. Uh, is it uh, advisable not to take drugs to stay more in the body, or is it all right for me to? It depends on the person and the time in your life, the circumstances. You must mm -hmm. do drugs when it is right. 
and mm -hmm. you must know that within yourself at some point. So, right, that's what I'm thinking, yep. Um, I must go for now. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Because they're calling me away. Right, that's the right time, yep. Um, mm, we have three more minutes. Can you give us a little of uh, poetry? Oh, poetry from my past or my present? Uh, either way. Okay. Why don't I give you some... Uh, I will give you something I understand or that you will understand. Here we go. Thank you. Thoughts stream through the mind and return to the body in some way. All things become part of you in a solid way, in a spiritual way, in a dimensional way, in a way that you must understand through the different eyes that you see through. Your eyes are not only located in your head, but throughout the spiritual reality that you ex experienced it through many lifetimes. And so use one set of eyes to look at things in one way and another set of eyes to see things in another way. Do not limit yourself to the human eyes or the spiritual eyes, but the eyes of all that there is. Remember this, all things are there. All things are meant to be discovered at the right time for the right reasons. And as I move forward to discover my intentions and reasons for being, I also discover pieces of you and pieces of the sky and pieces of eternity that has always existed, but in a different way. And I must look at them through different eyes. Thank you. Uh, I just uh, noticed that um, when you were uh, in Egypt, you were given a lot of parables and stories and myths to humans. Is yes. there anything you can share? What do you mean? Like an Egyptian parable, Egyptian story, or anything from the... No, it would take know, too long to do that. Oh, I see. Um, many of them are quite long. Right. Uh, many of them are quite detailed because that was the way of that time. You see all the hieroglyphics on the sides. That's sometimes, sometimes a whole side of a wall can be one story or parable. Oh, I see. Wonderful. Um, can you give a bless? Can you give a blessing in Egyptian? In ancient Egyptian, yes. Thank you. Ura, Miriam, Natya Watyandi, Tiara, Waha, Enzi Kura, Shola, Nati Tindiburdi, Turamanda, Kashi, Shat, Mukarimanda, what I see, Mukuti Papa, Pa, Kokwisha. Thank you. Hello. Oh, Jim, welcome back. Hi. 